We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I hope that this afternoon's excellence presentations have convinced you that the skin is very much worthwhile as a target of anthropogeny, the study of human origins. Skin is also very powerful in some places more than others. We are not comfortable with nakedness depending on where we grew up or when we grew up. So we like to cover skin. And we learned today that this creates a new ecosystem for some interesting animals. And uh, we've also learned that we have changed our colors many times in different directions. And our hair, shape and color. It is fair to say that skin is our largest organ. We have an ideal model, the wetsuit in Southern California, two millimeters, about the thickness of your skin and the surface of one of these banners, about two square meters. It is a self-healing barrier. It provides protection. It provides defense, thermoregulation, and energy in form of the brain battery and in form of your first food, naturally for two and a half years until average weaning age before agriculture. We synthesize vitamins there. It's a very important sensory organ. It's an ecosystem in more ways than one and it has strong signaling value. It even signals our internal state of mind when we blush or flush, either saying a lie or being embarrassed, more so if you're melanically challenged, as us people coming from northern uh, places where we lost melanin. So I think we have many, many things to discover in the future study of skin, and I urge you to stay here for the question-answer question session. Uh, but I'd like to, uh, for those who might leave before the, the answer session, I'd like to thank all of you in the audience, uh, to those to, who made the symposium possible, the symposium chairs, my co-chair, uh, Nina Jablonski, our featured speakers, our individual supporters, and of course, all of you for attending. Uh, so I look forward to a question session, and I think my co-chair, Nina Jablonski, will address the first set of questions. We have, not surprisingly, some, some wonderful questions that have come forward. A question first for Dr. Gallo. Since the sterile wound has more inflammation, should we be scrubbing people with betadine, et cetera, preoperatively or not? Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and it brings the distinction between pathogens and commensal organisms. First of all, scrubbing with betadine does not sterilize the skin. There's still a tremendous number of microbes that uh, persist, but betadine does minimize the number of pathogens, so absolutely we should scrub. That was clear enough. <laughs> uh, two good questions for Dr. Saka. The first, 
does the scalp and hair play a big role in heat loss? It does in cold environments. You have a tremendous amount of heat loss through the head because that's the exposed area and you don't get the constriction. But in a warm environment, um, you don't uh, have any exceptional amount of heat loss through the head. It's predominantly your, your skin of your torso in these areas are over, overlying the active muscle. Hold on, there's another question. A second question, many cultures believe that eating hot chilies in hot weather causes a cooling effect from sweating. Is this valid? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but. <laughs> um, not surprising, we have a, a group of people absolutely obsessed with the microbiome, and so we have a large number of questions, and some of these might be shared between Richard and Rob, so you guys can sort of divvy, divvy them up. Um, do chemical additions to Western biomes negatively impact our health? You've covered a comparison, but I'm wondering about the implications of research like this. So I think the effect of chemical additives. Uh, so we saw that data for the first time last night. Uh, we haven't had time to fully, uh, uh, to fully look into the health implications. So um, that's certainly the direction we would like to take the research though. Okay. With respect to uh, the fecal mi uh, microbiome, your studies show that it matures at about two and a half years. This coincides with the weaning time of the Hadza. Is there a mismatch between early weaning in the West and the gut, uh, gut microbe maturation at two and a half years? Um, that, that's a very interesting question. We've, we've looked cross-culturally at the specific effect of weaning, and what we see is that the maturation effect overall, um, although it's affected by weaning, um, children who are weaned at different ages still follow the overall pattern of maturation. So, uh, probably, uh, so probably it's not going to be an issue to wean earlier. Uh, again, um, none of this data existed three years ago, so the kinds of prospective longitudinal studies you'd want to see have not yet been done. Um, one, one thing I'll note briefly is that because the technology to do this has dropped in cost so rapidly, a huge number of studies are possible now that weren't possible a few years ago. So it's a tremendous opportunity for students getting into this field. What is known about the skin microbiome of populations with great longevity? Nothing. That's, a, that's another great example of one of those projects that you could do now that uh, you couldn't have done a few years ago. Does eating probiotic food, is that useful for the microbiome? After taking antibiotics, can we regain our microbiome? Uh, yes, um, a number of different a number of different probiotics have been clinically validated for post and uh, post antibiotic diarrhea. So, uh, in general, um, any of those probiotics or eating live yogurt uh, has been shown to be beneficial in several different clinical studies. Does chlorine in swimming pools act like antibiotics on the microbiome? Uh, great question. No data. <laughs> there we go, Rich. Maybe Rich has data. No. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that's, that's it. Thank you. A question for Sarah Miller. Um, how different are the human and chimpanzee mammary glands? So I don't think there's been a lot of comparative studies on that, but they in each case, there are two mammary glands which are um, pectoral. So the basic structure is the same, but I'm not aware of any detailed um, investigations, but they would be interesting. A question for anyone, but I'll take a stab at it myself. When during evolution did the sclera of human eyes become white rather than dark? We know that this is something that is a, 
a physical distinction of humans compared to non-human primates, and in our, including our closest relatives. Uh, I would think that this occurred quite early in our evolution and that it was an important part of our long distance signaling uh, and visual display uh, adaptation. It's hard to say exactly when this could have occurred, but certainly much of, of human facial gestures and many aspects of human gestural vocabulary are visible from a great distance, or at least from several meters. And I would think that, that they, there was probably a selection for white sclera, for increased visibility, and for understanding the direction of gaze at the same time. Okay, I guess I'll stay here then. Uh, so. Traditionally, high incidences of neural tube defects have been in, uh, found in northern latitudes, such as the UK and northern China. How did this correlate to UV damage to folic acid? Mm -hmm. High prevalence of neural tube defects in these populations is associated with extreme low folate diets. And so there was probably minimal amounts of ultraviolet radiation induced loss of folate in those populations. Rather, there has been historically and fairly recently tremendously low folate because in the diets. Folate comes from fresh green vegetables, citrus fruits, and whole grains. And we know that in populations that are eating very highly refined grains with not a lot of fresh fruit and veg, that there's a lot of folate deficiency. Thank you. And I have a question for Mark Stoneking. Does your study of body lice not shed light on the evolution of sleeping blankets, skins of animals, not clothing? This seems uh, more likely in light of the 40,000 year evidence of needles, fossil needles. Yeah, we don't know for sure exactly what the, uh, you know, the, the sort of evolution of clothing involved, but it seems reasonable to think that humans would have started out with wearing skins of clothing, uh, skins of animals, which would have probably been similar to the hair and may have facilitated the movement of lice into the hides or skins that humans were wearing. And then you later have the production of you know, real uh, woven clothing and so forth. I don't think humans were weaving that much 70,000 years ago, so. I have another question uh, for Sarah Miller. At one point, at what point in evolution did humans develop only two mammary glands? We've kind of touched upon this, so I would, uh, what is the implication of supernumerary nipples? Uh, so I don't think it's known at what point um, humans develop two mammary glands, but it's assumed that it happened um, perhaps in response to the decreased number of babies that um, humans have compared with some other species. Uh, in terms of supernumerary nipples, um, so I talked a little bit about how um, um, the um, mammary or milk line um, is an important um, embryological precursor of mammary glands, and this is found in uh, humans as well. And supernumerary nipples often develop along those lines. They can, in fact, very small ones can even develop during pregnancy. Um, and this is thought to be due to mammary tissue that has somehow got left behind uh, during the formation of the mammary glands. So uh, some of um, some circumstantial evidence and some of our own um, unpublished data suggests that during the formation of the embryonic mammary gland, cells actually move along the mammary line and end up in um, the positions where the mammary gland will form. So if those migrations fail or happen abnormally, this can leave behind a little bit of tissue that could develop a supernumerary uh, nipple either um, during embryogenesis or even later in life in response to hormones. Thank you. If you don't mind saying, I, I have a question, a uh, follow-up question. Do we have any information on, on the age of the permanent breast in humans as opposed to chimpanzees and bonobos, where breasts are not permanent, permanently enlarged? Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any um, 
evidence about that, but that doesn't mean there isn't any. They may, somebody may know. Thank you. And one last question for Rob Knight. And this is the question whether breastfed baby or formula-fed babies differ in their gut microbiota. Uh, yes, there's been several studies showing that, and uh, in general, the microbial diversity in the gut is uh, higher with breastfeeding. There's also some suggestion in the literature that breastfeeding may ameliorate the effects of early life antibiotics or C-section delivery. Thank you very much. I think that's it for questions. Um, so we're not, we're not sure whether the noticeable health effects of C-section in later life are mediated by the microbiome yet. So we know that C-section affects the microbiome. Uh, we know that C-section affects the risk of several diseases, including, uh, including atopic dermatitis, um, let's see, uh, food allergies, uh, pet allergies, I think are on that list, uh, obesity, um, asthma. Uh, what we don't know for sure is whether the mechanism by which C-section affects those conditions is via the changes in the microbiome, although we know, that, uh, we, we know mostly from animal model work with some evidence in humans that all of those conditions have been linked to the microbiome. So, so the links that exist are between C-section and disease, C-section and the microbiome, and microbiome and disease, but we don't know if the specific mechanism of action of the C-section is via those particular changes in the microbiome yet. Does that make sense? Okay, so this concludes our first ever Carter Symposium on the human skin. I look forward to a future one. Thank you all very much uh, for being here today, and thanks to all the speakers for their excellent presentations.